So I'm Russell Jones. I'm one of four GMs at Wolverhampton Wanderers or, or Wolves. Um, my particular responsibility is, is fan growth uh, and also then commercializing that fan growth through licensing, membership, media content, uh, and uh, sponsorship as well. Give it up for the Wolves. We got Russell here. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Um, Rich Orozco at uh, the Los Angeles Football Club. Who's been to an LAFC game? Oh, we got a lot. Oh, yes, Alex. Yeah. All right, uh, Darren, thank you. Um, I was number seven at the club. There's a guy back there. Uh, Benny Tran's right in the front row. He was number six. But uh, we uh, created a movement in LA, very proud of. Uh, it was all rooted in football culture first. Um, so meeting somebody like Russell's been very, very, very exciting. Um, my role now, I'm the chief brand officer for the club, so everything to put gas on the brand and to keep our community growing and on fire is what we have a hyper focus on. Hence this panel is how do we build our community and brand outside of the pitch. Sabrina? Hi everyone, I'm Sabrina Carroza. I'm a PR consultant for many different brands in the US market, including a couple of big soccer clubs, brands in media, sports, and entertainment. I also teach at NYU in the Global Sports Program, and I'm a part of Harvard University's Global Sports Initiative. And I'm an American, so I'll be referring to football as soccer during this presentation. Well, hi, uh, my name is Tiago Pinto. I'm the founder of Bowl Football. Uh, I'd say one of the newest uh, football brands out there. We do uh, uniforms, little shout out. And uh, I think the inspiration <laughs> to create the company is just as a, as a football fan, uh, I think, and, and there was a, another presentation in the morning that referred uh, to you know, football kids as passion. And as passionate about, I think most of the kids out there are, are lame. And our company uh, is out there to design custom kits for, uh, for every team. Uh, uh, in the world. Right, um, one thing which I think we should kind of actually name check in the beginning of this is actually this, the title of the panel is a New York Yankees moment and becoming bigger than, you know, like the Yankees became bigger than baseball. Um, an interesting point Sabrina made when we got together before this was referencing that of course it wasn't the Yankees that made themselves bigger than baseball, really it was the likes of Jay-Z and Spike Lee taking something like the Yankees cap and making that part of popular culture and hip-hop culture. And becoming part of another culture is a really hard thing to do when it comes to football. But Russell, that's something which you've done in many ways, but one of them being eSports, specifically in China, from what you've described as being a challenger brand. Do you give us a little bit of a kind of a background about what you mean, A, by a challenger brand, and B, kind of what you've been doing in China to do that? Yeah, sure, happy to do that, Paul. It might just be worth, if I can cue a video, um, which gives you a little bit more context on some of the things we've been up to, so that the dare to be different video. Super cool. Yes. Okay. We're on the way. Is that better?
Thank you. So to try and give that a little bit of context, so I'm sure some of you have heard of Wolverhampton Wanderers, other, others of you may not have. So we are a club that's got 145 years of, of history. We were one of the founder members of the first ever professional football league in 1888. We were then one of the founders of European floodlit football, playing against Honvid in 1954. And more relevant for this market, we were actually the, the champions of the inarguable uh, American soccer um, league in 1967. So lots and lots of history, and I suppose that's almost a fight that I have in terms of how do you take an incredibly historical brand and turn it into something that's modern and relevant for new audiences. And, 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 and certainly we, we, we sort of live on this dare to be different philosophy. There are, in the Premier League, six very dominant clubs who have turnover well in excess of, of, of Wolves. To give that again context, Manchester United's turnover is 1,000% more than ours. Uh, Tottenham's is 600% 600, 600 more than ours. So therefore, we have to be different to what they're doing. If, if we do the same as them, we'll never catch them. So therefore, we've taken a, a, a sort of a, a dare I, as, as Paul said, this idea of the ultimate challenger club. That's the, the philosophy, that's the pitch that, that we tell to, to, to commercial partners. And we've invested in different verticals. So we've invested into a record label. We've invested into esports significantly, and particularly in, in China. Um, we actually have five professional teams operate, operating out of China, and they have over 10 million social followers in themselves. So in China, we'd be better known as a, an esports organization than, a, than a, a traditional soccer stroke football team. And so, like I say, that, for us, that's the, the key part of our strategy is this, is very much this diversification and, and then telling that story internationally. But how have you been able to do that? Because that's not a conversation which a lot of clubs can have with those, you know, a lot of people in your position in major, major league soccer teams elsewhere can have. That's come from the ownership, correct? Yeah, so, so uh, the, the club is owned by a, a Chinese company called Fosun, who are, have entrepreneurship at their, at their core. And, and so their, their business portfolio is incredibly diverse. And when they came into the, the club, they would change culture very quickly. Um, Wolves had got a, a sort of a tradition of going up and going down divisions, and the fans had this phrase called, we're Wolves, eh, we? And actually, it was about changing that culture from this, oh, Wolves, eh, we? We go up, we go down, into this very driven, where there's you know, no acceptance of failure, uh, which very much is in line with, uh, with, with folks and thinking. So you've obviously came from a club with a very rich history. Rich, with all due respect to LAFC, it's a, a, a baby compared to where Wolves are in terms of kind of um, history and legacy. What did you have to do to kind of convince LAFC to focus not just on the pitch, but in all the other verticals and the other spaces as well? Sure. Uh, for, for those of who don't know our story, we were you know, given the keys to a new club in 2014. LA has 10 professional sports teams, including all the university teams. Um, there was a 25-year club also in our market. There was a club that failed over 10 years. So we were walking into a market that has already had two uh, football clubs, one that failed, the Lakers, the Dodgers. How do you create something different um, without a $10 million marketing budget? So I think what we did well, our key learning was we really spent the time on the inside to, to be very clear about what our brand was, our identity, who we were where we a club that would take a stand. Um, our three club pillars early, which resonate now, set, you know, five years in, is uniting the world city through the world's game. We all know the power of football in a global city. We talk about being, bringing joy to people you know, as an organization, and we also talk about being a force for good. And those were not normal business brand identity out of the gate, but it got us in the headspace of focusing on building relationships and not transactions out of the gate. Uh, and that's, I think, what created loyalty on day one. So I think that's our biggest learning. And there's some pretty amazing MLS stories in here. We got Darren in Atlanta who created a phenomenon, uh, Monster Respect. Uh, probably the first, uh, when they packed that stadium in Atlanta, like, it's, it's magic. And I think he had a lot of the same challenges. We have St. Louis in the house right here, who we're about to launch next year. And we've had really good dialogues about our key learning. So just our biggest share is, is the hardest work is on the inside. How do you get 150 people in your organization saying the exact same thing to partners, 
to fans over a pint, and I think that's what we did well, and that's what we tried to build on. I mean, Sabrina, your experience obviously comes from working with some of the, literally the top tier European clubs, the top Champions League teams. Yeah. Is it easier or harder to kind of work with them to get them to do the kind of things that Wolves have done and LAFC are doing as well? Well, it's all relative, obviously, and I think that the big clubs are doing some things that are really innovative and spectacular. You know, Barca launched a partnership with Spotify yesterday, which kind of embodies what we're talking about here in terms of being able to really pull in different perspectives across film, fashion, music, entertainment, to create a 360 experience, a lifestyle for fans, because that's how fans in the US experience sport more often than not. And the percentage of fans who are considered casual fans are growing phenomenally in the United States. And that could be because it is such a fragmented sports market. Every you know, market has NFL teams, NBA, MLB, NHL, MLS, and then you have your European clubs. So there's a lot that fans can choose from just on the sports side of it. And then of course there's always entertainment and music, concerts. And I think it's really smart for big clubs like the ones that I've worked with, Bayern Munich and Barcelona in the US, as well as for the small clubs to really figure out what that niche is in terms of creating an experience for fans that captures the zeitgeist of the market that you're looking to grow in. And that's the key is like in, in, in London versus in, you know, or, or sorry, in the UK versus in Spain versus in the United States, that zeitgeist is very different. So tapping into it and figuring out what the right approach is for your club based on size and resources and opportunity is the key. Um, I, and honestly, I really don't think that the big clubs have an advantage. I think some people think they do, um, but the reality is the big clubs and the big brands also have a long tradition behind them. And that tradition creates you know, a conservative approach in a market that requires more boldness. So um, I do think that everyone has an equal shot at connecting to the zeitgeist in America, regardless of size. A word that you mentioned there, which kind of leaps at me, was boldness, which ties very nicely into kind of what Tiago has been doing. I um, mean, you can obviously tell everybody what you've been up to, but work with the likes of Montserrat. We talk about small clubs, small countries, small um, international companies, countries. Uh, you don't get much smaller in terms of brand friends <laughs> than Montserrat, but what you're doing with Montserrat is very much different than what Montserrat would have done with um, you know, other people like your company. Yeah, I think for us, I, I mentioned briefly here in the, in the opening, the motivation behind uh, creating ball is about this, you know, the respect for the game. You know, I think it's, it doesn't matter how big the club or the national team is. Uh, your kit is really an identity for, uh, for the players, you know, for the city, for the country, or, or even for a cause, right? It, it is something big in our, uh, in our current culture. And, uh, and we believe that any team, country or club team, uh, deserves to have custom-made jerseys with custom designs that tell the story of that, uh, of that club. And, and the way we tie into brand building is that we don't, we don't design a kit we first work with who we, or the team that we're working with to understand the brand plan, right? What is the message that is being conveyed? What's the story? Uh, what's the history? What is the message that that kit, kit has to engage with, uh, with, its, uh, with its audience? So the process is the same, right? Uh, Montserrat happens to be the smallest of all 206 countries uh, that are affiliated to FIFA. But you know what? For them, it's the identity, the green speaks to to the earliest stages of immigration when Irish influence in, in the city. By the way, uh, upcoming uh, St. Patrick's Day is the national holiday. It's not a, a place just to go out and, and have some fun. It is the national holiday. So there's a great story behind uh, the Emerald Boys, as the team's called. Our role is to craft that story uh, and, 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 and speak it in, in, and tell it in multiple ways, at retail or the jersey, the, the jersey design, uh, uh, the content that we put out. So I think it, it's, it's, it starts with respect for the game. So it's very frustrating as a fan, right, when we get uh, uh, to see teams with wonderful stories, great history, great connection with the fans, wearing jerseys that are just like the opposing team, just with different colors, right? That's not what the game is about. And, and uh, uh, for us uh, as a company, we have this, this statement, we're only about football, we respect the game too much to treat it, uh, a jersey as, as just a, a commercial item. Of course we sell it, 
at, at, good, uh, uh, at good margins. It is, uh, at the end of the day, a business that we all have to, uh, to benefit yeah. from. But the, the, the first intent is respect to the game, uh, 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 regardless of the size of the team or its importance in culture and all that. At the end of the day, everybody understands the weight of a kit. I mean, as far as, as, far as music goes, that's something which has kind of come up a few times. I mean, your name checks. Darren, the work Atlanta are doing with regards to the music scene is obviously well known. Russell, I mean, considering that you're actually from the UK, maybe the world that Wolves are doing music is less known over here. Would you mind giving us a bit more of an elaboration about what Wolves Records are up to? Yeah, sure. So we, we launched Wolves Records now six months ago. The, um, I, I was actually quite surprised that we were the first UK football club to launch a record label, mainly because it just makes a lot of sense to me. We have all the uh, the assets that you would need to run a label. We have a stadium for live events. We have videos that reach 1.5 billion people a year. Um, and why not give local talent a platform? All those videos are going to need some kind of soundtrack behind them. We're going to need entertainment of various different times during our match day experience. So really what we did is this label not only enables us to sign acts, obviously make money, distribute, distribute music, but it also enables us to give opportunity to talent, some of that talent we might not sign. So for example, um, the president of the label, he was, he's, he's a manager for James, which is quite a famous band in the UK, and he actually brought that band to Wolverhampton. And as part of that, we were able to give a poor opportunity to, to someone locally. So bands were invited to submit their music. The, the best music was then sent to the band, and they picked a, um, a young female artist called Bryony Williams. And suddenly, this lady's gone from nowhere, and she's on the stage in front of 3,500 people playing the biggest gig of her life. Now, she's not going to sign for the label, but what an incredible opportunity for her. Um, so, so that, I, th I suppose, for us is, is just as important as the revenue opportunity is really that giving, giving local people uh, a platform. So was that the driver for it? Because just because you mentioned you have a stadium, you have some of the connections. You, that doesn't necessarily mean you should do it, it just means you can. What was the driver for actually doing it? Was it revenue or was it more than that? I, th I think it was, it was all of those things. I think revenue clearly plays an important part. Obviously, I said right at the start that you know, my job is, is to create that commercial revenue that, that, that makes that gap between us and the, I say the traditional top six smaller. Um, we, we have a, uh, our vice president, he's a famous musician, some of you will know, called Robert Plant. Uh, he's the front man from Led Zeppelin. So he was able to open some doors for us at, at Warner, Rec Warner Records. Just some small just, doors, yeah? <laughs> yeah, just some small doors. When Robert calls, you answer. So uh, that's obviously very helpful. So suddenly now we've got Warner Music that are interested in helping us recruit artists, distribute our music, lots of sync opportunities they're providing to us. So uh, sometimes these things just fall into place quite naturally. Sabrina, from your experience, and you, obviously you mentioned the Barcelona Spotify deal which mm -hmm. was yesterday. When it comes to the US markets, where does music fit in there? Is it part of the tactics, or is, it, is, is that the biggest one, or is, it, is there much more than that? Well, I think music, fashion, entertainment are all equally important in terms of a fan being able to experience your club in a more holistic way and to fit into the lifestyle that they have. So I think, you know, instead of looking at fans as like this fan is a Barca fan, this fan is an MLS fan, is really just there's a sport culture now that we're living in in America and that culture includes all of the different things that we're talking about here, like what fashion you wear, what music you listen to, the, the, the documentaries or the movies that you watch. But you hit on something that I wanted to talk about too, which is this idea around commercialization. And in a way, I feel like sometimes soccer clubs get it wrong in terms of their approach in the US market. Right away is always to hire a commercial person and come and figure out the best ways that they can earn money here. And if you look at the EPL teams and what NBC has done to really help promote the EPL and soccer here in the United States, it was all about giving stuff away for free, giving the content away for free. And I feel the more that a club or really any entity, any sport club, fashion brand, music, you know, entertainer that wants to expand in the US market, give that content away for free and make it easy to access, in that way, it grows, and then once it's grown to a certain level, then look to monetize it. But I feel like 
you, the, the monetization sometimes gets in the way of the growth opportunities that are there. So, um, you know, music, film, entertainment, fashion, all of it is really important to create an experience, a 360 experience, but also give it away. Don't expect money up front for things that you, you're looking to grow in the U.S. market. So, um, give that access to fans, and that's something that NBC, I really give a lot of credit to NBC for you know, making games available on linear TV and accessible to, you know, American families on the weekends to, to be able to en engage them in the culture and the, and the games on the weekends so that they can go and then buy jerseys once they know who the best players are and they know the teams that they want to support. So that's one area that I feel like needs to improve in the U.S. market. It's just access. I mean, you mentioned celebrity. Rich, you're in L.A. <laughs> You've got to be just drowning in celebrities turning up at your games. Is that correct? So how do you kind of harness that power? I, I, I didn't hear the first part. Um, you're in LA. Yeah. So really mentioned celebrities. There are a few cities as synonymous with <coughs> celebrity as LA. Yeah. How do you work with that? Is that something which you, you have a strategy for, or do they literally just kind of turn up at your doorstep? Uh, I, we, there, you can be lured into paying publicists and appearance fees, uh, but all of us know those people don't stay. Mm. So I think e everything we've done, we've attacked from a place with some roots and traction. How do we keep traction? So when I go back to identity, you know, we were the first club to do a partnership with Adidas Originals with a custom Samba. But we chose the Samba because the Samba connects to global football culture. But if our stadium wasn't rocking and our supporter section wasn't taken care of well enough, there'd be no depth in that collaboration. Uh, with celebs who come to matches, you know, we like to look in their eyes and we want to know, are you... I, I, we use the language a lot of being culture curious. Anything you're building, any brand you're building, we want to attract the culture curious people into our stadium. You know, our stadium is not packed because they're all football fans. There's ones and tens. But you want the one who's on their first journey learning about BBB. I see you, Max. You're paying attention? All right, good. <laughs> but you want the one talking to the 10, sitting next to Tiago, and talking about how that reminds him of where he comes from and football culture. So um, with the celebs, with influencers, ideally, they're culture curious. They want to be about the wolves. They want to support the wolves, and that's the traction you've gotten. So uh, we really want to focus on depth versus the super surface PR influencer. Here's your check. Goodbye. But celebrities can absolutely drive a lot of interest in your product because Americans follow celebrities and athletes before they follow teams and clubs and, and leagues. So it has been very helpful for a club like Barcelona, for example, and others. You know, many of the clubs who come on tour in the U.S. market during the summer friendlies, they will leverage every opportunity to connect with U.S. celebrities and you know, sports, you know, professional athletes from other sports across the U.S. because they know that's a really great way to capture audiences, just connect to their fans. So when it comes to European clubs and coming over, is, does that always work? Do you find it's the celebrities who are driving this more than the clubs who are driving it? Do celebrities want to be attached to the Champions League clubs? Well, here's the thing about European soccer clubs is, I mean, everyone here is an expert and knows this, but European soccer clubs are huge globally. So for an artist or an entertainer who's very popular in the U.S. but still needs to grow globally, soccer clubs represent a really great opportunity to do that, and vice versa. So we can leverage their celebrity in the U.S. market to build a presence here. And I think it's a really great collaborative effort that you know, Rich had mentioned you can do often in kind as opposed to paying for, you know, appearance fees and things like that. So actually the biggest thing that's happened in the US as far as football, I'm going to keep saying football, everyone knows it means soccer, it's fine. <laughs> um, is actually the World Cup in four years' time. What kind of opportunity does that bring in creating this, this Yankees moment and helping clubs or players or other brands kind of escape from the pitch? I think, you know, in, in, in our case, we're really focused on national teams because we're really focused on what uh, Rich was saying around identity. Right? Uh, a, a team kit is, in, in several countries, represent that, that it's your primary uh, way of expressing your culture. So there's a lot that you can put into a jersey and, and, and express that. And we look at uh, 2026, I think it's, it's two things coming, uh, coming at once. First is here in North America with a lot of games played in the U.S., but also Canada, uh, countries uh, with a lot of uh, immigrant populations. So it is already a place where you're going to have a very uh, uh, varied audience looking for ways to connect to the game, right? And then on top of that, there was just the, the, the organizational change that will allow for 48 clubs to be part of the, 48 nations to be part of the party. So I think it's a great communion of 
uh, different uh, uh, cultures being in the same location and 48 different teams that will re relate to that. So I think in our case as brands, primary uh, opportunity, you know, have teams that will play uh, uh, the game. Other than that, uh, also, you know, how to tap into the different cultures that maybe uh, their uh, nation will not be present here. How, what's the way to, to represent? So I think uh, 2026 has that primary, and then I think, uh, you know, uh, 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 my, my fellow panelists will also be able to talk more, even more, more in depth than I do, about what's the, what's the legacy of 2026 for the local leagues or for European clubs uh, being present in the market. Uh, we at Bolsa, as a, as a tremendous opportunity, stepping change, uh, you know, it's already grown uh, so, so much, right? But I think 2026 is, is a step change because it will go mainstream, right? The celebrities and everything that we talk. You know, World Cup is, is a World Cup played here. I can't even imagine what it will be. I mean, speak from my own personal experience. I got into football through USA 94. And I was a kid in England. It was a World Cup England weren't even present at. But that's what kind of, it, that's what got me interested. And then off the back of that, I kept an eye on US football. I, I met, I don't know if he's here at the moment, but I met Alexi earlier on. And he was kind of one of the first players who I kind of remember seeing. So, so even for a, a kid in a country that wasn't present in the World Cup in the USA, that still is what kind of attracted and me to it and grew it. Just to add to it, I know we're talking about the Men's World Cup, but quite frankly, the Women's World Cup really has done tremendous work for us here in the US market in terms of building the profile of you know, American soccer fans because women are, you know, women, the US national uh, team is amazing and incredible and that, that team has done so much to grow soccer in America. So um, you know, I just wanted to give a shout out to the women's, you know, uh, national women's uh, soccer league because they've done a tremendous job in building the, the market here for soccer in the US. So the Women's World Cup you know, had huge viewership numbers, and I think the Men's World Cup will do the same, of course, but um, you know, the, the women athletes definitely have a higher profile in the US market than I think many of the MLS team players do, or the men's league. So all this idea of getting into whether it be esports or fashion or music, you need people to be able to help you understand to do that. You look at, I mean, we haven't mentioned them at the moment, they're kind of a bit of the elephant in the room, Paris Saint-Germain, um, Fabien Allegri, who did that. His background was in uh, music, if I'm correct. Um, Juventus' CMO, Mike Armstrong, he's come from an esports background. Yep. Is there going to be a tendency, you think, of clubs bringing in, whether it's chief marketing officers or other people, who haven't got a football background? Or do you do, for instance, Russell, I presume you bring in the talent, you partner with people who really know what they're doing. How do you find those kind of partnerships? Uh, I think there's a bit of both, to be honest, Paul. I, I think that Certainly, if you're serious about a business investment, then you need good people. Mm -hmm. uh, I, when it comes to Wolves Records and certainly that entrepreneurial spirit at, at Wolves, we are we're encouraged to learn. So we don't necessarily have to hire somebody that knows everything from day one. We have a very brave culture at Wolves, so we're, we're prepared to make mistakes. You know, we're not afraid of our fans sort of telling us we've got this wrong and that wrong. Um, we'll listen, of course, but it doesn't distract us from, from what we're trying to do. So I think there's an element of that. And then, of course, we want to partner with world-class partners that can get us to where we want to get to as fast as we can possibly get there. So in the case of um, Wolves Records, being able to partner with a company like Warner Music mm -hmm. would just enable us to get to where we want to get to much quicker because they can help us open those doors. You know, they, they know all the DSPs they know the radio pluggers, they know, they can just get us into these areas very, very quickly. I mean, same must be true for esports, right? Because you're cracking not just gaming, but also a completely new market in China. You yeah. have to have a certain kind of understanding to do that. Yeah, definitely. I, I think with, with esports, we've, we've had a similar situation. So we, we've brought in experts in the UK to manage our, our teams. And then over in China, we've done, we've done likewise. And we've purchased franchises. So, you know, we've looked at the most successful teams in, a, in honor of Kings, and we haven't been afraid to make that investment in that franchise, which is a, you know, it's an eight-figure investment to bring in that winning team that enables us then to go and tell stories in China um, and also bring in that, in that sponsor revenue to start to, you know, to, 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 to pay back our investment. And are you seeing fans, are you seeing Wolves football fans becoming fans of your other teams, or is it... Or does it go both ways, or are they completely separate? I think, I think there is some natural sort of cross-population between, 
between our teams, but that's not necessarily what it's designed to do. Um, from our perspective, it's about new markets, it's about new fans, um, certainly uh, our esports business in China, I know will be more famous as an esports organization than will be, will be as a football club, and, that, and that's fine. It's absolutely fine. You know, this is not about necessarily Wolves only being a football club. This is about becoming a sports and entertainment business. But once again, that kind of diversification I mentioned about becoming more than a football club. So it's kind of why we're here. I mean, we still have a bit of time. I'd like to leave a little bit of room for some questions afterwards as well. But just kind of going <coughs> across the panel, where do you think this is going to happen? When, when will football be able to look at itself and go, we've had our Yankees moment? Or when will a team be able to do the same thing? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I don't, unfortunately, we don't have a Jay-Z with a, with a, with a cap. So look, I, I actually think it's going to happen through, through gaming, um, for, for pr probably for us. So we invested relatively recently in, um, in Fortnite as, as one of the, the gaming uh, platforms that, that, um, that we have professional players in. I think that um, I know this because some of Fortnite would be pitching sort of licenses to various different Premier League clubs, and I know there was international clubs involved as well. And I suppose we took the view that rather than a very small license fee, to us it was much more valuable to be able to reach 80 million unique users every month in the game. And I suppose I taught from the experience of having a 12-year-old that's, that's glued to Fortnite with all of his mates. Uh, and actually, he went off and wrote this entire presentation for me about what we should be asking Fortnite for, um, which was the... Getting an experts against what we are discussing. Yeah, this is my export. Yeah, absolutely. So branded gliders and, you know, the, the, all sorts of guns that were gold and black, and you can, you can imagine. We'll, we'll hire him. Yeah, exactly. Well, Good we, press. He did. He, he, yeah. he's, this kid knows everything. So, uh, you know, it's, it's incredibly exciting for almost me as a dad to be able to work with him on this project. And we asked Fortnite for a number of different things. One was an influencer to work with Pedro Neto, who's one of our players, to create some content. We had one of their influencers who was a commentator that commented over a live tournament that we did. And obviously, we had the wool skins in the game. And we deliberately d designed the skin so that it wasn't just a football uniform. We wanted this to be cool. We wanted, genuinely wanted kids in the game to, to have this super cool uniform. So I think, you know, and, and then we've also done a license to deal with NBA 2022. So the only football club in world football that's got branded skins in the game is, is Wolves. So you can go and get a Wolves basketball jersey and sort of play 3v3 street football and street basketball in the game. So I think that, that Yankees moment for me is going to be when, you know, those, I, I see those kids thousands of those kids in the games, whether it's Fortnite, whether it's in the metaverse, you know, wherever it is, with wall skins. And actually, they're not wearing those wall skins in the game because they love the football club. They're wearing them because it's just cool. Rich, same question to you. Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think the MLS is about, I think we're 10 years away from our Yankees moment, and I think everything's, everything will be driven by supporters. So you see, it, you see Atlanta, I just talked to St. Louis, they're building a safe standing supporter section. Uh, we went to BBB two years before we kicked the ball to research safe standing. Everything in our brand is driven, that's the soul. So what I respect a lot as I got to know Russell is like there's a wolf soul that we all know from the outside even, you know, whether we're deep into it or not. And if you go to Wolves game, you have 100 years of soul already in that stadium. So I think we're 10 years away, but it's all gonna be driven by supporter driven clubs. Because then all these collaborations, uh, we are going to drop a record label soon, by the way, so I'm not going to give you any credit for it. <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> but everything starts with the people, and, and you have to have that soul to amplify it with these collaborations. And I think, I think we're 10 years away, but it's coming. Um, Charlotte, 75,000 in their first match, like, wow, I incredible. So um, I think we're 10 years away, and it's going to be driven by the fan section, by supporters. In terms of fashion, one thing that's just, I love about LAFC is your logo. Banner cap, that's got to be the LA equivalent, surely. You've got to be able to break that. There's got to be somebody who's going to wear that and people are just going to associate it with Los Angeles. Yeah, that, the, the quick cap story was fun. You know, our, our headspace was to create the next Dodger cap, right, to grab culture. But again, if there were not 3,000 people at our game in that section proudly wearing that cap, raising that cap when they sing the national anthem, it wouldn't have the magic it would. We actually ended up selling 40% of all headwear in Major League Soccer before we kicked the ball by trying to find a symbol like that. Um, but again, I, I go right back to, you have to have that army of people 
who, want, who are really behind the club and what they stand for. And again, I, I go to this guy. But I do want to toss one quick thing to Tiago because um, for those who, who don't, are, are getting into a story, starting a new kit company is incredible. But, but you were talking about the soul of the region that you were exploring. So I think that's, that would be super cool. I want to tee that up to you because I thought that was really cool as I got to know you. Cool. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about, you know, uh, Yankee moment for national team. And thanks for, uh, for teeing me up because, you know, we're w working in, in, in a region that every, you know, nobody's looking at uh, as, as a football uh, uh, birth town. But then you look at the Premier League, the amount of players from, coming from the Caribbean. Right, Trinidadians, uh, Jamaicans, or Haitians here in the U.S., all these items, there are a bunch of players. You know, I think uh, yesterday in the opening, the, the president of CONCACAF laid out a few of the challenges that CONCACAF faces. We face it every day, trying to help those guys elevate their, uh, uh, their uniform game, right? That's what they're really looking at. They're, they're, they're worried about putting 11 uh, uh, competitive, uh, a team of, com of competitive 11 guys on pitch. What we are thinking is the Yankee moment is, is saying it's the coming out party for the Caribbean football, right? Also Central America, they, they have very different roots and ways of expressing the games, but is there coming out? I think the Central America ha happened before. I think we can, we can help them uh, uh, brand it in a way that is exciting, right? Other than, oh yeah, those are just the small teams that come and go from the World Cup. There's, there's nothing there. We, we, we think we can help it. But, but Caribbean, I think uh, if we look at that uh, with uh, the reggae boys, you mentioned the reggae boys in 1998 in France. Um, I think to us, that is kind of th that moment. But that was in France. Everybody was looking as a curiosity. I'd love to be in the stadium in the first game of a Caribbean uh, uh, team playing the uh, 2026 World Cup, playing their national anthem, and everybody representing that. Well, that's a new culture coming to football, right? They play in a very, very uh, uh, different way. Very tough game. Everybody thinks it's all friendly. It is a rough game, right? But they play with their hearts out. Most of the countries have tremendous difficulties. Let's talk about Haiti, uh, Haiti uh, what's going on right yeah. now. Right? We're, we're there to, trying to do our, our part. So I think it's going to be a huge coming out party for the culture of the Caribbean. Right? Expressed through football. But then if you look at uh, Caribbean culture, uh, and that's what we work on. Right? We do the kids. But we, we are working with uh, music, food, color, beach, and then you, you, you can add to all that uh, uh, around the Caribbean. So for us, is how do we wrap that culture and bring it on in shirts? I think we have the perfect stage in 2026. And um, you teed up for me, I'll teed up for the president that was here uh, 36 hours ago and said, well, we need the uh, support to make it happen. You know, we are here, we're reaching out to all the countries. We'd love to hear back from them, right? Because that's the story we want to tell. You know, we need the, the, to play their part. And I think the, 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 the region has tremendous challenges in even understand what we're talking about, right? By the time we talk about branding, they have some others. We're extending uh, our arm to work with them. We're still four years away. And, uh, you know, hopefully you guys are already uh, our guests, right? I, I handed out some, just, you know, I handed out some jerseys in the, in the, in the backstage. You know, hopefully we're all going to be wearing this jersey in four years' time. And a women's in, uh, cut jersey, which I really appreciated. Thank you for first, that. First brand ever to do that in the region, right? We do a, a women's cut for I mean, the, for the a, countries. We, we have time. Do you want to tell the story that you're telling us backstage about the lady you met at the airport? How <coughs> many difference that made? Yeah, that, that, that was, I, I think, you know, creating the, the, the company was the best moment that we had so far in the company. I, 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 for, for a reason I'm not going to get into the de details, I went to meet, meet uh, a female player for the Trinidadian national team a few weeks ago at the Miami airport on her way to, uh, to Trinidad to play for the national team. And we were chit-chatting, and then she looks at me and says, can I give you a hug? And I said, yeah, for sure, <laughs> right? So we, we, uh, uh, we hugged and said, can I take a picture? I said, yeah, of course. So she took a selfie, and then after she, she, she was all smiling, I said, do you mind me asking why, right? She said, because I want to send to my teammates to, sh to show that I met you because uh, I wanted to show appreciation for what you guys are doing at ball. I said, what are we doing? And she said, it's the first time that we ever played in a new jersey. Not the female cut jersey, a new jersey. We're talking about Trinidad and Tobago, one of the top teams in, in our region. The women's team that are doing very well, by the way, in the World Cup qualifiers. Right? It's the first time she told me, we're not playing with a hand down uh, shirt used from the men's. And uh, therefore, I want to show my appreciation. That, to me, we can close the, the company tomorrow. We're happy with what we achieved. <laughs> <laughs> <Just like that. laughs>
she's part of that. No closing the company. But listen, I hate to burst the bubble here, but I, 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 the soccer clubs are having their Yankee moment right now. They have been, and they're not capitalizing on the moment. So you walk on the streets of Miami, you walk on the streets of New York, LA, wherever. You, actually, you know what, even in the Adirondacks, I was up in the Adirondacks in the middle of nowhere, and I saw kids wearing Barca kits, Real kits, different kits of clubs they probably had no idea who these clubs are, the culture of the club, who's playing on the team. And, and that's your Yankees moment. You're having it now. So like there's a very strong call to action to take advantage of this moment right now where young kids are playing FIFA and they know who your team is through FIFA. They're wearing your jerseys and consuming your merchandise and they don't even know anything about you. The moment is now to reach out to them in a very, you know, a, a less terrifying way because I can tell you as an American working in soccer, it is a little bit intimidating because there's a culture that like if you don't know football, and you're not welcome here. And I'm, I'm the kind of person you could tell I really don't care about that, so I push my way through. But there is this feeling that like Americans feel left out almost of your culture and what you bring to the table. So as much as you can welcome us in and connect to those young kids who are wearing your jerseys and playing your team on FIFA, you're in the moment right now. So don't squander it, it's right now. And, and, and these kids are waiting for you to reach out to them and make a connection. There you go, Sabrina's told you, sort it out. Um, <laughs> we still have a little bit of time left. So if anyone's got any questions, uh, we have one already, that was quick. There's a microphone on the way, I think. St. Louis. <laughs> St. Louis, yeah. Uh, the great panel, like super, super interesting. Um, I got a question that kind of riffed off where Sabrina went with that last point about youth, like uh, across the world, like, you know, in the Premier League, like the average age of a season ticket holder is 43. I know that the MLS is quite young, but young people have a different relationship with live sport now. And I wondered, uh, you know, if either Sabrina, through your consultancy, um, that you get questions about youth or like Rich Russell, like how are you taking youth from, you know, FIFA into real life sport? Um, how are you focusing on bringing young people into the game uh, in a, a purposeful way? I think I want to hand that to you, Russell. Russell. <laughs> yeah, sure, I'll go first. Um, you, you, I agree with you. Uh, obviously, I talked a little bit about Fortnite previously, and again, I get to see that exactly what you were talking about through the eyes of a 12-year-old. So he would, there's no question, rather watch an end-of-season Fortnite event than a live football game. And that's, that is a challenge for all of us. Um, last summer in the UK, there was a, an event called The 100. It was a cricket event. Uh, and again, I know most of you will be like, cricket, well, that's the most boring thing in the world. <laughs> exactly. But they turned this into a really dynamic, really engaging event, both on screen and also in person. And I, I've had these conversations with the Premier League, and it's, it's difficult right now to change that broadcasting product. It's, it's so successful. It remains the biggest league, the most watched league in all of the world. So right now, they don't need to change that product. But I do feel at some point there needs to be a red button situation where there can be a, a slightly different tailored product for this young audience that's coming through. Because I, feel, I still feel the live product is there. You know, when people are going to the game, it's certainly a wall, it's a very buoyant, it's packed, it's noisy, we have light shows, we've got DJs going on. It's a very immersive experience. But when you take it to broadcast, you know, as a 40-year-old guy, I'm watching it, and the, the commentators are people that perhaps I used to watch playing, so they're relevant to me absolutely not relevant to my 12-year-old. So I, do, I, I would agree with you. I do feel that there needs to be some thought put into you know, how are they going to make that engaging for, for young people. I think we, from a club perspective, try and do it through, through content, through, so through influencers, um, creating content that we feel is relevant for that, for that young audience. Um, but it's, and certainly we do it through eSports as well. And um, we live stream in Fortnite events, uh, FIFA, as, you, as we've already talked about. So it's, I, I think we're on the journey, and I think we've, it's been raised as, a, as an issue, but I, I genuinely don't think that it's, there is a solution for it right now. I think it's been interesting what some clubs have done with TikTok as well, and they've taken what is traditionally a highlight, even highlights. If young people aren't watching a full yeah. 90 minutes, 
they're even now pivoting towards TikTok highlights because they're produced in a different way and more towards them rather than... Yeah, TikTok's interesting because it's not about... Most of our other channels are all about subscribers to that channel, where you're specifically subscribing to get content from that club or organization, whereas TikTok's a different algorithm. People are literally just watching entertaining content. Um, and, 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 he, and so you're right, and I, I do think it's definitely got a place to... And we're, we're a bit more cheeky with our TikTok content. And so uh, I know our sort of content team fight against our PR team sometimes on TikTok. Like what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. It's a bit more cheeky and, than perhaps we would normally do on our other channels. It's a different tone of voice, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, anyone else got any other questions in the audience? One right at the back. Thank you. This kind of goes off what you guys are talking about, but this question is for Sabrina and kind of how are you capitalizing on that Yankee moment, you know, for Barca here in the US, more like social media and digital, you guys are touching on TikTok, but how have you really capitalized on that and turned it into not making these huge broadcasts, but these short little short contents that go on social or digital? Yeah, I mean, I think Barcelona aside, because they're my client, I can't really you know, share too much about their strategy behind the scenes, but you know, the general point that you're making should be something that all clubs, and, and, and I think more traditional, unfortunately, European clubs, have to come to terms with the fact of how Americans consume content here if they want to grow and expand in this market, and creating that snackable, entertainment-focused content first, and leading <coughs> with that to pull people in is really important. And you know, clubs that are more traditional and have a long history of being conservative, it's more challenging for them to step into a market like this that's, you know, in a sense, from an entertainment perspective, way far ahead. Like, for example, what the NFL does versus what a European soccer club does. And um, it just speaks volumes about the different culture in each market. But I think if you want to expand here, yes, they'll have to figure out ways. And US tours are generally the best ways where European clubs are able to connect with celebrities and athletes from other sports to create at least some connection to the zeitgeist that we're talking about here, whether it's a fashion you know, icon or you know, a musician or you know, Julia Roberts, for example, came out and, 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 and seen one of the clubs that I work with while they were on tour in LA. Those cultural moments where you can tap in do so much to drive energy and interest and followings in this market way beyond any highlight or you know, game, uh, game footage that, that could be available for free, for example, in the US market. So it's, a different, it's definitely a big switch for European clubs, but one that is very important to their growth here in this market. So hopefully more step up to do the type of content that we're used to in this market. Anyone else? I have a question. Oh, that's too rich. <laughs> I, we have a bromance brewing here, you guys. <laughs> you I grew up in LA. Jersey. Buy your bold jersey. Jersey. Okay. I, I grew up in LA. <laughs> Let me ask you a question, serious question. Is there any Galaxy le uh, fan left in LA? Is this being recorded? <laughs> <laughs> For a podcast, you get my plug at the beginning. There's a few left. There's a few left, but they're in pain. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Thank you. There must have been. I mean, obviously, you referenced Galaxy there. With LA, um, LFC, there has to have been a differentiation of the brand when you set up right to break away from Galaxy. So how? That must have been a quite a. Uh, uh, there must have been a lot of conversations around how you did that. <laughs> yeah. The the short version. Uh, mad respect for their organization. They were first mover in MLS. Um, you know, they, they paved the way for all of us, but, um, you know, we, we all hear the stories of the challenger brands. And again, I grilled Russell when I met him, but what, how can you be disruptive? And I think we just grabbed the, we grabbed the grassroots and we stayed there and we were very consistent. And a lot of marketers, you'll develop a program, you'll have a one-off, you'll have a one-off fan fest, a tour, and you're done in the market. Um, we stayed and we were very consistent uh, with our identity, with our soul, with our programming. And it just stayed people power because they did go celebrity and signing a big player with big social media following. Uh, and I don't know if there was enough attention on the roots and the core and staying in that conversation. It was very much PR marketing driven. And, I, and a market like LA, it, it's a big city with a hunger for grassroots, like any city is. Uh, and I think we just went there and stayed there. Fantastic. If there's no one else, I think we're, I think we're done. Uh, thanks for everyone for attending. Thanks for the panel.
And yeah, it's been, uh, it's been really interesting. Really glad to, uh, you could all make it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for Thanks having us. Well. Thank you.